Lee, hi, and hello from the Midlands. Hello, Adrian. It's great to be with you. We ought to tell people that you are talking to us from Colorado, but you were born in Coventry in 1954, raised in Birmingham until you went to university. Obviously, a long time since you've lived here. What does the Midlands mean to you? Uh, Well, you know, it's the formative years, isn't it? I mean, actually, I was conceived in Leicester, born in Coventry, (laughs) (laughs) and then grew up in in Birmingham till I was uh, 18. And so, and my my dad was a civil servant. um, And in, in the old system, your promotion meant that you were moved around a lot, you know, like every few years in, in the early stages, which is why it was so, um, you know, the Leicester, Coventry, Birmingham thing. Then he went on to work in Walsall and Wolverhampton and so on. So, yeah, for the first 18 years of my life, the Midlands was it for me. And of course, it was quite a long time ago now. Sadly, I'm getting very old. So that um, the whole context and the whole culture of the nation was different. It was very... Uh, much more regional. The, the instant communication or the instant familiarity between one place and another was was different back then. You were very much limited to your immediate surroundings. And other places were like distant rumors. I mean, I can remember eventually when I graduated university and went to work in Manchester, I was meeting people who who thought of a trip to London from Manchester as sort of dangerous and exotic as perhaps going to Moscow or something like that. It was a very, very parochial world. And so the Midlands was all I had for the first 18 years, which are obviously the formative years of anybody's life. Um, so when you ask what did the Midlands mean to me, I mean everything. It, it was it, that's who I am. That's where I grew up. And I think that sociologically and culturally, we don't change all that much uh, after those early years. You know, your first couple of decades, that's who you are. And you grew up in a suburb of Coventry called Steichel, I think. Can you remember anything of Steichel? I know you left at the age of four, so pretty young. Have you got any (laughs) memories of Coventry? Oh, yeah, I do. I mean, you know, they are typical childhood memories, a bit incoherent, a bit sort of episodic. Um, But yeah, I I remember certain things very well. I remember the house that we lived in. I remember uh, my dad going to work on his bicycle. Uh, Coventry was a tremendous bike town. And I remember, for instance, at the end of a shift in the factories, you would have thousands, literally thousands of men coming out on bicycles. It was like a tsunami of bicycles. Uh, ten abreast down the street, off they would go back home. I remember the uh, the bombed-out cathedral. Um, and a lot of bomb damage, you know. As you know, uh, Coventry was, was bombed badly in, in World War II. And because of various circumstances, it was taken a long time to, to fix that damage. And I was born nine years after the war, and my, so my memories are probably, you know, at the earliest 12 or more years after the war. But still, yeah, there was tremendous damage. There were bomb sites everywhere. The wreckage of the old cathedral, and next to it would be the building of the new cathedral. And that, I remember, we would do that as a, a matter of routine uh, when we went shopping on a Saturday. We would visit, you know, stop and see the progress Um, so I have very very blurry, very fragmented, but very fond memories of Coventry, really. In general, I think everything about me and therefore everything about Reacher is somehow connected to the national response to the Midlands. Uh, you had to be an outsider, really, if you came from the Midlands, because I was very much under the impression, subliminally, that the rest of Britain kept you at arm's length. You were never quite allowed to join, uh, you know, being English. It was, they treated you with a certain amount of suspicion and, frankly, a certain amount of contempt. And I think that's what gave the Midlands its both its strengths and its problems. 
Yeah, we'll explore that in more depth as we go. But what was Birmingham like when you moved to it at the age of four then? This was in the late 1950s, both Coventry and Birmingham and the rest of the country still recovering from the war, really. Yeah, August 1959, we moved to Birmingham, uh, which was just the month before I started at primary school. And um, what I remember about both places really was the, there was fantastic prosperity in the sense that people were working. There, there was virtually no unemployment. Everybody was working. Uh, and the Midlands was really powering uh, the, the post-war recovery financially. So I do remember the fact everybody was working and everybody especially the blue-collar people, really, because of unions, because of uh, the structure that had been built up over the previous decades. People had a little bit of money. I remember my grandma coming down from Yorkshire, which was really 10 or 20 years behind the Midlands even then. And uh, she came down for one Christmas, probably about 1961, I would think. And she went out with my mother to do the last minute shopping. And she came back absolutely quivering with excitement because she had seen a normal person with a five pound note. <laughs> and she had, she had never seen that in her life. She herself had never touched a five pound note. And that kind of industrial prosperity is what I remember. Everybody was working. And that had so many ramifications, to be honest. It made a, a very self-sufficient population, a kind of self-reliant population. It was baked into everybody that you got these raw materials, <clears throat> you worked on them, and something finished came out the other end of the factory. And that was an attitude that kind of suffused everything. If, if, you, if you, your window broke or something like that, you would fix it yourself. If your cooker went wrong, you would fix it yourself. Everybody had a familiarity with in industrial process. And that gave it a completely different atmosphere that I've really never experienced anywhere else. And you've been at pains in the past to stress that this wasn't just metal bashing or people working in foundries, which may have been more typical nearby to Birmingham in the black country. A lot of this work was very fine work, work of great craftsmanship. It certainly was, yeah. I mean, I remember the car business, which was immense. Uh, you know, Longbridge, for a long time, actually, had the world's longest production line and uh, immense workforce and immense productivity. Um, and then the other th another third would be the super high-tech uh, metal finishing, where people would be extruding, you know, which was a word I didn't know as a kid. What, what is that? They were extruding these alloys with long names that you couldn't even pronounce or understand. Um, so there was a high-tech sector. And then there was the kind of down and dirty workshop sector, um, which I knew best really through friends that I had locally. If you wanted something made, you could get it made, whatever it was. And these would be small workshops. And I remember one of them that where my friend's dad worked, which it had an earth floor um, and a couple of lathes and a couple of drill presses and three guys. And they would make anything you wanted. It's worth stressing though, isn't it, that your own family, although your dad was white collar and he was a civil servant, you weren't particularly well off despite that. We weren't. I mean, it, it was a peculiar inversion, really, that, you know, the unions in Birmingham and the productivity were so good that blue collar people were earning decent money, actually more than my dad, probably. Um, but for him, it was, you know, a, a silly status thing. He... Uh, you know, he, he, he loved that whole thing about being middle class. That's, that was his ambition. Um, and really, you know, if you, if you look at the key to my life, I would say it is I, they were desperately trying to be middle class in an environment that was entirely created by the skilled working class. And it really made for a, for a kind of tension that they never really got over. Before people get carried away with some kind of rose-tinted sense of the past, I just want to quote from 
your autobiography on IMDb, the Internet Movie Database. I don't know whether you wrote this, but it says Lee Child was born in the exact geographic centre of England, in the heart of the industrial badlands. Never saw a tree until he was 12. It was the sort of place where if you fell in a river, you had to go to the hospital for a mandatory stomach pump. The sort of place where minor disputes were settled with box cutters and bicycle chains. He's got the scars to prove it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's great it's a brilliant autobiography whoever whoever wrote that deserves some credit whether it was you or not but w- was it really that bad on the mean streets of Birmingham it was I mean that's uh, I, obviously some publicists wrote that based on what <laughs> listening to me talk about it and it's not true about the trees we had a <laughs> we had a tree in our back garden as a matter of fact and uh, so I'd seen a tree but the rest of it, yeah, I mean, it was uh, certainly the pollution aspect was horrendous. The, uh, you know, Birmingham is unique among cities in that it doesn't really have a major river uh, like, like mo- a lot of cities do. It has small little things. And the one nearest us, you would go down to Great Bar and Perry Bar and uh, the, the River Tame, I think it was T-A-M-E. It yep. was... Uh, sluggish and oily and it did go on fire a lot and nearby there was a little patch of ground where with two little sickly trees growing and with a sort of yearning irony we we called that bluebell woods and uh, (laughs) it was this muddy patch except the mud was not mud it was like oil waste bubbling up and uh yeah we were prohibited from going there because if you got it on your clothes your clothes were ruined and if you got it on your skin you would have to run home and wipe it off with lighter fluid because people assumed it was very bad for you and you talk about the river sort of going on fire then what spontaneously combusting because of all the flammable liquid yeah basically because of the hydrocarbons and all that sort of stuff in it. it it i uh, people don't believe it, but if people that lived there remember it, it was periodically, I mean, not every day, but once in a while, there'd be some spontaneous combustion and, and you'd have this strange blue flame hovering above the water. And in this tough industrial city, you were a hard kid from pretty early on, weren't you? You were tall, you were big, you were tough. I was. I was a great fighter, and I loved it. I I was very good at it, and I I saw nothing wrong with it, and I enjoyed doing it. And uh, it started in Coventry, really. I mean, it was one of those strange things about people where you've got to divide yourself somehow into uh, in or out, you know, tribes and all this kind of thing. And our problem was uh, we were – our family was aspirational. You know, they wanted us to do well at school. And if you were that sort of a family, then you had a target on your back. Uh, You know, if you were getting good marks and doing well, even though discipline in the schools was fine back then, you know, very traditional. There was no, none of this sort of mayhem in the classroom or anything like that. But on the way to and from school, there was this weird hierarchy of uh, if you, if you were trying to do well and getting good marks, you were a target and people would be lying in wait for you and all that kind of thing. But that suited me fine because I loved it. I was good at it. And um, it got even worse then later when I went to the posh grammar school. Uh, you know, that was a nightmare. Every morning I would have to fight my way out of the neighborhood and every evening I'd have to fight my way back in. But it was fine. I didn't mind it at all. And the problem in particular for us in Birmingham was Hansworth Park, which was um, – between where I lived and Hansworth itself. And uh, that was territorial in that old-fashioned way where, you know, you weren't supposed to go to this part or that part. Uh, But if you wanted to walk through, then, yeah, it would be. And bicycle chains were a big deal. Um, I remember actually a funny thing happened. It shows you how your psychology is fixed all the time. I was up in Wyoming uh, where I have a ranch, and there's a sort of outdoorsy, like climbing, hiking store in Laramie. And I saw on the counter they had these things called Norwegian saws. And what they are is it's the chain off a chainsaw with all the little teeth. But instead of being in a chainsaw, it has a wooden toggle on either end. And the idea is you throw it around the tree and then you, you sort of move your hands left and right 
and you cut through the tree. Uh, you know, it's a good survival tool, I suppose. And I remember I, it just flashed into my mind. God, I wish I'd had one of those when I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned your posh grammar school, King Edwards High School in Birmingham, which you had to pass the 11 plus exam in order to, to go there. But reading your biography, I get the real sense that your junior school, which was called Cherry Orchard in Hansworth Wood, in a way had a more profound impact on you. What do you write there? Yeah, I mean, in, using that word profound, what was the foundation of my education? And that was definitely Cherry Orchard. It was a very plain county primary school. It was old-fashioned education, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and uh, almost nothing else. So I left there when I was 10. And uh, I would say at that age, if I'd never learned another thing in my life, I would have been absolutely fine. I could have gotten through life perfectly because they taught you everything you basically needed to know. And in terms of that development as well, I know that you've said you felt unloved as a child. You had, a, I think it's fair to say, a problematic relationship with both of your parents. But close to you, you had a library called Elmwood Library in Hansworth Wood, which sounds, from what I've read, to be quite a magical place. Just describe the walk up to Elmwood Library. Yeah, it was... Uh, it was. Uh, it shows up in the bio biography, and, uh, and some of the local people remember it differently than, than I remember it. So I can't say for absolute sure what's true or what isn't, but it looked to me like... Uh, a building had been demolished behind a congregational church because there was a patch of crushed brick, which we were very used to back then. I mean, that was usually a bomb site that had been bulldozed and steamrolled. Um, and, you know, we would play football on it or whatever. And uh, there was, some people say it was like the end room of a larger building, but I remember it as a standalone wooden structure. And you went in and it smelled of dust in a particular way uh, and, and it smelled of books. And there were low shelves, not all that high um, and not all that many books, as a matter of fact. It was a small branch library. Uh, but I loved it. To me, it was, it was like a portal to escape because you could get a book and you would be taken out of yourself for however long uh, you were reading it. And I just loved that feeling, and I loved reading. And fortunately, my parents, for all their faults, were very into reading. You know, they were very happy that we, we were reading. And so they collaborated in a, in a scheme, a bit like voting in Chicago, where you, you'd get a, everybody had a library card, but, of course, you could only borrow two books on, on each card or ticket. Um, so anybody who ever came to our house, all our relatives, if they ever visited, we would sign them up for a library ticket. And <laughs> even our dog had a library ticket. <laughs> and so instead of two books a week, I, I could get five or six books a week. And yeah, I just I, I loved it. To me, it was uh, it was a magical place, but small. And so after a few years, I'd exhausted it. Really, I'd read them all, and then about the only sort of good thing my mother ever did, she then signed us up for the library in Tower Hill, which was at, like in the next municipality, and you had to cross a canal over a very scary high bridge. I remember that, the footbridge over a canal. And you would get to this much bigger library, and that was like heaven. It was just unbelievable. It felt like an infinite selection of new books. What kind of things were you reading then? I read all the usual stuff, started with Enid Blyton, uh, you know, the famous five, the secret seven, the island of adventure, all that kind of thing. And then, like every other kid, I moved on to Biggles and uh, all of that stuff. And then Alistair MacLean and so on. Just, uh, I read Billy Bunter. Uh, I loved... I love discovering a new author, especially if it was a series, because then I could just race through 10, 20, 30 books. It was great. Yeah. You've talked about how your parents were both 
repressed in terms of their personal attitudes and very aspirational in a way that you suggest was quite overbearing for you. Would it be true to say then that the library saved you? Oh, definitely. I mean, I've done uh, I've done so many library events uh, because I just feel like I need to pay it back. I mean, totally. It saved me. Uh, it created me in in a lot of ways. Yeah, without without those two libraries as as a little kid, uh, I would have been a completely different person. And so, yeah, every, every word you can think of, saved, created, uh, rescued, all of those words are true. And we're talking then about a kid, you, who is rough and tough, willing for a fight, more than happy to take anybody on in a fist fight, but who's also a really keen and enthusiastic reader. And then at junior school and onwards, you discover theatre as well. It started at Cherry Orchard, which, as I said, was very traditional uh, in every way, except for the headmistress, who was a woman called Maisie Lister. And she actually was the aunt of an actress called Carolyn Lister, who was extremely locally famous because she was in Crossroads from the beginning. <laughs> and younger, reader, younger listeners might need reminding or telling that that was a famous soap opera made in the Midlands about it a was fictional a, motel. At a fictional motel, and it was the paradigm of all cheap soap operas in that, uh, <laughs> you know, the sets were wobbly and uh, and all that kind of stuff. It was a classic. And she was in it, and her aunt was our headmistress, who was totally obsessed with show business, and she loved American musicals. So twice a year, once at Christmas and once in the, uh, in the summer, uh, the school would put on a show, which was, generally speaking, uh, a random selection of musical numbers from her favorite musicals, linked together by some completely meaningless action. And... Uh, you know, it was a, in the school hall, which, looking back on it, was pretty small. Stage at one end and the lights and the beaming children on the stage and the, and the beaming parents in the seats. It, it was such a happy feeling. It was warm. Uh, it was about love and approval. Uh, I somehow intuited that you could be on the stage and you would receive love and approval from an audience, which I was not getting uh, as a person, uh, as you know, an individual child. And so from that, literally that moment on, I was hooked on the idea of some kind of performing that I could get the love and approval that I wasn't getting elsewhere. And really that is the the backbone of my life. It has been ever since. The only problem was I had no talent to be actually on the stage. I, I, you know, I can't sing. I can't dance. It was, a, it was a severe problem. I knew exactly what I wanted to be doing, but I couldn't do it. I had no talent, and, uh, except for the backstage stuff, which actually, for me, was lovely and better in a way. So I have been on stage in various contexts, but only, you know, typically what happens in theatre, even at quite a high level, is if there's a tiny little part, uh, like a walk-on or something, then the stage manager will do it. Um, and so I have been on stage once or twice, but fundamentally my heart is backstage. And uh, so I've always done backstage jobs. It sort of migrated then into television. And then writing is is the ultimate backstage job because... Theoretically, if you think about it, it's not about the author at all. It's about the book. It's the book that's in the marketplace. And the author is way behind it in the shadows. And so, yeah, you know, that, that has been the operating principle of my life, to try and entertain an audience in the hope of getting love and approval. Having gained a love of theatre, though, you then discover the greatest playwright, arguably possibly the greatest Midlander of all time, William Shakespeare. And that comes about pretty much by accident. It does. And, you know, you, you, you told me beforehand you were going to ask me for notable Midlanders. And obviously, in my line of work, 
I'm going to start with William Shakespeare, who was just a transcendent genius in terms of uh, of being a writer. I mean, beyond, not even on another planet, you know, in a completely different galaxy from anybody else. Um, and the, I was first exposed to him. I think I was about nine, probably. And my mother was a member of a, a club called, I think it was the Young Wives. And they had uh, block bookings with Stratford. Um, and we, they would take it turn and turn about. My father would take my elder brother on the first occasion. And my, my mother would take me on the next occasion. And I remember... Uh, you know, being told we were going there. And as you said before, you know, I was a rough, tough kid. I had, I, I read a lot, yeah, but, you know, I was like, I thought, why, why would I want to see that? And I was skeptical about the whole thing. I thought it was la di da and I thought it was not going to be for me. But it was one of those magical experiences that happens to you a couple of times in your life, if you're lucky. You sit down bang, two hours are gone, and you've just been completely enraptured by the whole thing. And uh, I remember every detail about it, just magical, just wonderful, even the costumes. I mean, everything was great. And uh, there's no reason really why a nine-year-old in the modern era should understand Shakespearean language and all of that. But don't forget, the RSC at Stratford were just magnificent at, uh, you know, they were probably the best company in the world at the time and certainly the best Shakespearean actors you will ever see. And it was just all completely understandable. You could follow along. It was obvious. It was great. And from that point on, yeah, I thought, wow, you know, this is. But, of course, falling in love with Shakespeare early is bad for a writer because you are, ne <laughs> you are never, ever going to get within a million miles of it. And the thing that I really... You know, I've written 25 books and uh, I've uh, probably three or four times had in, those, in that quarter century had that feeling of euphoria that the line you just wrote is really pretty good. You know, you just think, yeah, God, I nailed that. And I've felt, I've, I've felt that probably three or four times in 25 years. Shakespeare was feeling it three or four times every hour. You know, it was just uh, <laughs> phenomenal. So you've discovered this love of theatre. You're into your, into your reading, but you're also kind of a tough and good-looking young lad. And into all this then, you're entering the world of sex and drugs, of rock and roll. That was very much your era. Now, we're going to draw a discreet veil, don't worry, over the sex and the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> but the rock and roll, there was plenty of that. There was, a, yeah, that was the whole parallel strand of what was going on. And again, I had no, really no musical talent, but that was the paradigm for me. Really starting with the Beatles, it was so obvious, you know, the, the, the adoration, the ecstasy of, be, of being involved in either giving or receiving that, that uh, pop music in the beginning. And, um, and yet then it, there was an absolute explosion, really, uh, everywhere. Uh, every, every town had had uh, a music scene going on. Yeah, there was so much going on in in, in the Midlands in particular. Uh, you know, it was just great. It it was it's impossible to communicate now to to the younger generation. You know, now if you want to see a great band, you book eight months in advance to some stadium thing for a ticket that costs like a hundred bucks, and you have to. It's a big, big, big deal. Uh, but back then, no, it wasn't. You, there was no pre-booking of anything. You would show up at the door with two shillings, and uh, you would get in, and you would see some staggering band, you know, that was amazing. Yeah, well, there were really thriving rock scenes across the Midlands. In Birmingham, where you were, was the club described by the DJ John Peel as the greatest club in Europe, which was Mothers on Erdington High Street. And you, you went to Mothers, didn't you? I did. It was a weird place. I think it, it it was upstairs. I remember that. It was above a furniture shop, I think. That's right. I mean, 
It was the, the strangest places. Yeah, uh, that I loved Mothers. It was brief, actually. It didn't last all that long, but it it uh, there were some great shows there, some great gigs. But that was how it was. You would take the bus to Erdington, and you would go upstairs above the furniture showroom, and you would see Pink Floyd or whoever. It was um, quite amazing. Yeah, I think there's a famous uh, live recording, isn't there? At Mothers in Erdington, one side of Pink Floyd's Umma album yeah. was recorded at Mothers. You you were there. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, t- I think, truthfully, partially recorded at Mothers. I think it's a blend of two gigs, uh, one from somewhere else. But, yeah, I was, at, I was there for that, uh, for that Mothers uh, performance. And so I suppose probably some of the applause on there is me. Mm. And, I mean, you said you had no musical talent. You did play with a band as well, didn't you? A band, very Tolkien-esque name, Dark Tower. <laughs> yeah, but I did. And, and uh, we were pa- we, I can remember at least two gigs where we were actually paid, uh, you know, oh. ticket money on the door and all of that. Um, but fundamentally, if you took the entire population of the Midlands, uh, males between the age of say 16 and 24 and you divided that by four that was the number of bands there were like everybody was in a band what were you Were you a guitarist i was a guitarist back then yeah but really terrible at it afterwards i tried saxophone and then i i i, I ended up on bass guitar because i figured that there's only four strings and you don't have to play chords. And so it's got to be a bit easier. <laughs> and uh, I seem to remember from a previous conversation that we had as well, that you used to practice at the Midlands Art Centre, uh, which is still there. It's uh, an art centre in the middle of a park in Birmingham, but it was very new then, wasn't it? And I think you ended up hanging out with Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin there. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the art centre was a, one of those uh, municipal initiatives that was fantastic. I mean, it had been, and I can't remember what was there before. I think it was something really awful, like, was it a slaughterhouse? Or, I mean, it was something really horrible. It, it was what they call a brownfield site. Uh, but they built this fantastic new art centre with theatre theater space and rehearsal rooms and art, crafts and all of that kind of thing. Uh, all kind of self-directed. You just showed up and you basically booked a, a room and did what you liked. And uh, I was only sort of 14, 15 at that point, And so I uh, still going to school. So if we ever rehearsed or did anything with the band, we would always finish by, say, 11 o'clock or something because we had to, you know, get some sleep before school the next day. And the really cool kids, of course, were the ones who had already left school. And they would book the room overnight for their rehearsals because that was, you know, they didn't have to go to school the next day. And I remember a kid coming in, you know, I was sort of 14. He was probably 19. And so he looked like a god, you know, and uh, tall, skinny, long-haired guy. Very, very pleasant, very polite, well-spoken guy from, uh, I got the impression he was probably from Hales Owen or somewhere like that. And um, he came in to take a look at the facility because his band was going to rehearse there. And and that turned out to be Robert Plant, yeah, uh, ready for (laughs) Led Zeppelin rehearsal. (laughs) There's a a great story that you saw Led Zepp at Birmingham Town Hall and they were so loud (laughs) that your watch broke. Uh, Yeah, Yeah, that's totally (laughs) true. I I mean, that was the thing about Zeppelin, that they were a quantum leap louder than anybody had ever been. And, uh, yeah, they toured, uh, it was su- early summer, I think, 1969, at Birmingham Town Hall, you know, which is this very grand building. And inside, you know, it's all plush and velvet and the big organ at the back and everything. And, and Zeppelin were on stage, and they were shatteringly loud, like nothing you'd ever, ever heard. And I got the night bus home after the gig, and... Uh, uh, I couldn't hear a thing the conductor was saying. My ears were ringing, and I checked my watch to see what time it was, and it, it stopped. It, 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 yeah, it, the sound was so loud, it, it somehow screwed it up. There's an incredibly vibrant music scene. Uh, Birmingham, through Led Zepp and Black Sabbath, was giving birth to, to heavy metal at the time, a, a musical genre that's gone around the world. Yeah, I remember that. I remember three consecutive weekends. Uh, we were into this band called Earth, 
And I remember uh, going to a gig. It cost two shillings uh, to see Earth. And then the next Friday, I did exactly the same thing. Went to see him again for two shillings. And then the third week, it was two and six because they'd, uh, they'd changed their name and become Black Sabbath. You know, the prototypical Midlands band in terms that they embraced the Midlands values. Uh, you know, it was an industrial sound, an industrial approach. But uh, there were a lot of others around that were just as good, actually, but never quite made it. There was the Edgar Broughton band uh, that were actually as good, I would say. But it was it taught me early that there's no guarantee of anything. You know, I'm not saying Sabbath were a bad band. But obviously, they weren't, but they were one of half a dozen great bands. And why did they make it and nobody else? It's one of those mysteries of life. Mm. Before we move on in terms of your life and leave the Midlands, as it were, pretty much every Midlands town or community of any size has a football club. And although we're not seen in the same sense of the as perhaps the northwest of England or the big London clubs, I would argue that the passion for football is every bit as great here. It's just more diffused because that's the kind of region we are. And it is every bit as much a key to the identity of Midlands people as anywhere else in the country. This is the place where the Football League was founded, after all. Well, exactly. And that, that's the point that, you know, it's very, very Midlands, very practical. They actually got on with it and did it. You know, they formed the, <laughs> uh, they formed the league uh, in, a, in a practical operational sense. And again, it's exactly like the Midlands in that we do not have the glamour that, for instance, Manchester has. This peculiar English psychology, the pecking order or the hierarchy, the Midlands always comes at the bottom. And that has repercussions everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. We invented the Football League. But if you are some you know, Brazilian superstar or something like that, or let's say you're Lionel Messi looking for a contract at the end of your career, you might well go to Manchester. You would not think of going to Birmingham simply because the impression is so negative and has been for so long. And you Why know, do you think that is, Lee? Well, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, this is really one of the huge questions that we have to ask. Uh, what is the problem? It's some kind of class thing. It's some kind of regional prejudice. It's some kind of highfalutin prejudice against grubby manufacture, I suppose. Uh, you know, in the 19th century, and in general in England, this was a huge problem, that people that made their money in manufacturing, they wanted to get out of it straight away. So that if you had made a fortune spinning cotton or bashing metal or whatever it was, you would want to send your son to Eton or something, and you would want him to be an aristocrat. You wouldn't want him to take over the firm. Uh, th this kind of prejudice against manufacturing somehow tainted the whole region in a way that did it a huge disservice, in my opinion. Uh, I felt all the time that Birmingham and the Midlands as a whole was fighting against a huge negative impression. And so 90% of their effort was just trying to keep their head above the PR line. And there was no energy left to move forward. It, it, it really puzzles me in a way. Um, other countries that are just as cultured and famous, like Italy. You know, Italy has tremendous art and history and, and culture and so on. But they treat engineers and manufacturers in uh, with a lot more status than the, than the British do. Mm. And I know you've said previously that you see yourself as a citizen of the world and you kind of quite enjoy being the outsider, which by moving out of this country, you, I suppose you guarantee wherever you are. But it also strikes me that although you might have left the Midlands, the Midlands hasn't left you. You almost self-consciously have a, a Midlands attitude to work. It's infused your work ethic and what you think you're doing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That because uh, to write a book is is not about you; it's about the reader. Uh, you've got to be very clear that you're producing something that somebody else will consume. 
And in fact, if they don't consume it, it's the same thing as not having done it at all. If you write a book and nobody reads it, have you actually written a book? It's like that Zen proposition. <laughs> and so I was very aware of that Midlands attitude. I mean, it's commercial, obviously, but it's also practical. You make something of sufficient value and attraction that other people are, are going to want to consume it or own it. And so, yeah, completely, 100%. It was a, a Midlands attitude. Get the work done. No fuss, no drama. Get it done right and then move on to the next one. And so say all of us. Brilliant stuff, Lee. Lee, uh, before we finish, I'm going to take you through a few questions uh, to just kind of very briefly plumb the best of your Midlands experiences. But <laughs> um, go on, then. Your favourite, it can be as brief as you like on these, your favourite Midlands memory. Ah, uh, gosh, my favourite Midlands memory. It's a peculiar one, actually. It's sort of, it was when they were building Spaghetti Junction, uh, you know, in, it, it, to the north of Birmingham City Centre. It was that was exactly the same time that I turned seventeen and was learning to drive. And one night I was driving home from somewhere, and I got caught up in the half-completed spaghetti junction and i was at this one place where everywhere seemed to be blocked off and so i i saw a small gap and i drove into this gap thinking that here is the part of the road that's open uh, and I, then i jammed on the brakes because i was about to plummet off a section of the flyover that they hadn't yet finished oh, <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> so that kind of <laughs> that was a very Midlands memory for me because it was, you know, that, that sort of optimism of youth. I thought, you know, I'll find my way through here. But also that, that huge investment, you know, that huge project that, because it was a revolutionary thing, Spaghetti Junction. Nothing, had been, nothing like it had ever been seen in Britain before. A symphony in concrete. Right there, yeah. your Midlands masterpiece. I'm going to say Villa Park for that. <laughs> uh, you know, not not just because of the sentimental attachment to the football, but because of what it represented. As we said before, you know, this was where the football league was invented, and this was like building a cathedral to a new populist activity, uh, and it was done with great aplomb and great seriousness. The the uh, you know the the stand is the brick and the stained glass and all that kind of stuff. It was so permanent and so magnificent. They weren't messing about. Great stuff. Okay. Well, not great stuff <laughs> from my point of view, but I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, you may have already answered this one. Midlands hero. Well, we talked about Shakespeare, but I've got yeah. I've got another pair that, that I really think should be mentioned in, in, in the context of uh, – my time in the Midlands, and they would be Jerry Dammers and Horace Panther, who yeah. together in Coventry actually formed Two Tone Records, yes. which was uh, very important in my opinion because the music was great. I mean, I loved, I loved the scar. You know, the music was great. Indigenous organic music coming out of the Midlands, it was wonderful. But also, you know, we've got to be honest about it, race relations in the Midlands in the 60s and 70s was pretty bad. And the initiative to, uh, to form that kind of mixed race cultural output was very valuable. And to call it two-tone was a brilliant message because it was saying to everybody, look, the future is going to be two-tone. And uh, it was something that needed to be said. It was incredibly valuable. And, uh, you know, for me in person, if I was hanging out with school friends from the posh side of Birmingham, that was all white all the time. But hanging out locally with my local friends, right from the beginning, it had been a mixture. And I, I, I observed... Uh, this progress during my life, negative progress, really. As a little tiny kid, when I was first in primary school, um, you know, we had black kids sitting next to me in the class. That was the Windrush generation. Uh, and that's why I got so mad about that Windrush scandal. I mean, those guys sat next to me in primary school. Obviously, they're British. 
Uh, and it was no problem until somebody decided it was a problem. Then this propaganda started up. This was a bad thing. And that lasted really 10 or 15 years. And it was took people like Two-Tone Records and so on to start to make a dent in that. Um, and so, you know, it was valuable musically, but it was also very valuable socially. Yeah. Brilliant. Lee Charlie, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on Made in the Midlands. Thank you, Adrian.